So we start the recording. So good afternoon, everyone, and and thank you very much for joining us um, in our last seminar of the academic year, um, which is organised by the Centre for Primary Health and Social Care at the School of Social Sciences and Professions. Um, so I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker today, uh, which is Professor Chris Chandler who is Head of Psychology um, at London Met. Um, Chris uh, has researched for many, many years now on the ne neuropsychology of addiction and substance abuse, including um, alcohol, smoking and drugs. Um, other areas of his work where he has written books as well are attention, deficit, hyperactivity disorder and psychobiology, which is also known as behavioral neuroscience, which applies um, biological principles to our understanding of behaviors. And I'm sure he will be unpacking quite a lot of those concepts as he um, go through his presentation. So um, the topic of this seminar today is uh, neuropsychology of addiction beyond the substance. And he will take us through some research findings and, and future direction as well for his research. We will have time um, for questions and answers at the end of the presentation, so I'll encourage um, the audience to use the chat box as we go along. Uh, please do if you will, I and mean, you know how to do it. Otherwise, we will be, um, you will have the opportunity at the end to ask questions using your microphone. Um, so over over to you, Chris, please. Oh, well, thank you very much, Yolanda. Um, thank you for asking me to do this. I know you, you've been trying to pin me down for a little while, but now that everything's sort of calmed down a little bit, maybe the calm before the storm, um, you know, I'm here today. So uh, what, I, what I propose to, to discuss today is looking at addiction, but not looking at the drug itself, but looking at how the world around it really conspires to maintain this problem for people and actually giving up drugs, whether it's alcohol, nicotine or cocaine or heroin or whatever it is, is actually made doubly difficult by the fact that our brains have become well attuned and well accustomed to processing things that are predictive of the drug uh, in, in the world. But to get to there, I thought I would give you a little bit of a background to, to my perspective, the way I, I look at things. And uh, as Yolanda was, uh, was, was suggesting that I'm a psychobiologist, which means I take a biological perspective, which I know is not everybody's cup of tea. Um, but I, I, I started in this I by looking at, in it looking at dopamine and my, my, my area of interest with dopamine was looking at Parkinson's disease and schizophrenia really early on, uh, over you know, 25, 30 years ago, indeed. Um, but staying with that idea of dopamine, I, I'll say you got your hands up. Well, I'll carry on. Um, carrying on with that, the, the, the theme of dopamine, I moved into studying addiction. And this was uh, uh, something that I did with, with, with regard to nicotine uh, primarily, but also amphetamines and morphine. And I took a neuroscientific perspective on it uh, and dealt with uh, the, the sort of biological basis of all of this. Um, and using behaviorism, I uh, the the work of animal learning theorists to try and understand what was going on in the brains of uh, people or animals that were uh, addicted to various substances and always looking for a kind of common mechanism. After a while, I came a little bit dissatisfied with these very basic, well, they're not basic, but they're they're learning theories that were embedded within laws of learning that were put down by people like Pavlov and Skinner uh, many, many, many years ago. Um, 
it didn't really account for everything. So I, I moved into a more human cognitive way of doing things. And this was um, to look at the information processing that changes in somebody who has a, a substance misuse problem. And psychology tends to go through fashions, uh, starting off with neuroscience, into behaviorism, into cognition. And, and then it goes back again. When we're, we're back to a neuroscience science basis again, or that I am uh, going to follow through today and try and explain how this world conspires. So what I was, what I, um, what I focus on was, was the, the, the fact that dopamine was deficient in a group of people, whether it's people with addiction or whether it's with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Not so much with Parkinson's disease anymore, although there are people working on that, particularly with the issues around gambling uh, that uh, emerges uh, in this condition. So th th this is that a neuroscientific focus has, has been where I, I've looked at. I suppose we need to define really what why I'm looking at uh, addiction, and then it's really because it's a it's a long term problem. Uh, alcoholics and anonymous talk about recovery and the idea that you've never recovered, but you are in constant recovery, and that the one day at a time is an important mantra that they uh, uh, talk about. But it's a chronic and more problematic relapsing disorder that is about seeking out drugs almost to the exclusion of everything else in your world. And you do this even when the knowledge is there that looking in the mirror tells you that it's not good for you. It's actually, it, it's slowly perhaps killing you in many ways. Of course, it is those people that have significant problems. There are groups of people that don't have problems and, and abuse substances, but they don't really come into contact with the services unless, of course, the judiciary get involved. But from all of this, from this, this um, definition, a, a neuroscience definition, a, 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 a medicalized definition, it all involves changes in brain circuits neural circuits that are involved in uh, reward, uh, which we'll look at in a moment. And where I want to go to is to looking at the roles of stress and, and sex hormones, but also the fact that we have diminished self-control when we take drugs and that we are finding it incredibly difficult to put the brakes on and say yeah, en enough is enough. So they that this is my, my sort of uh, uh, perspective. And I'm going to bore you with these sorts of things, that, that little phrases that I've, I've been trotting out over the years, where I see it as a triumph of motivation over reason. It isn't, you know, the continuation of drug taking isn't really rational. It doesn't have, a, 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 you know, in the face of the evidence to suggest that it is, it is doing you considerable harm. But there is a motivation, there is a drive that, that overrides all of this. And it makes it a really tough problem to deal with. It's certainly been a tough problem to deal with from a medical perspective, from a psychological perspective. And it's a massive problem from a policy perspective. And I think we need to, to look at what is going on with, with, with the brain of somebody who's engaged in substance misuse. One, I suppose I should sort of caveat here. One of the things I'm not going to be explaining is why people start in the first place. And I think really there are going to be multiple reasons why that may emerge. What we know about most of all, and we still don't know that much, but what we know about most of all is what happens when somebody starts the process, once they take their first drug, once they have their first drink. So it's, you know, it's, I often also refer to it as an unhappy byproduct of evolution, that actually motivation is a really important um, construct for us to engage in. It keeps us alive and that we, we need to be engaged in certain behaviours for that. But of course, addiction and substance misuse is something that is 
a, a, a grotesque and extreme version of that happening. So when we're looking at the uh, addiction, we're actually looking at motivation in many ways, uh, motivation that has become problematic. So to start off with, we, we you know, as a neuroscientist, we will often look at the animal literature and see what what animals are telling us. And of course, uh, uh, you know, we're not going to talk about animals getting addicted like humans do. But obviously, the use of animals has been informative, although questionable in, in some cases uh, about what they can tell us. But we'll, you know, we'll be take a pragmatic approach at the moment to suggest that actually they provide useful information. But one of the things that you, 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 you identify quite quickly from the theories that have been generated, and I'll talk about the one theory that I've really sort of honed in on over the years, is that they are about addiction being a learning process, that we learn to become addicted, that it takes, it takes a bit of effort, it takes rehearsal, and this rehearsal and this repetition of a behavior um, changes the brain. Whatever you're doing, whatever you're taking, the behaviors, the drugs, they're changing your brain. And these will underpin and mediate future uh, motivational behaviors. Now, I say here, it starts with behaviorism. You know, if we look at a rat or a pigeon, um we you know in, in experiments in psychology traditionally they will perform a task such as pressing a little lever or or pecking a, a little uh, button and they get a nice little bit of food they'll do exactly the same for drugs um, so our understanding starts with those basic rudimentary of uh, learning theories that it's simple if you perform a behavior and you get something that you want you're more likely to do it again and then you're more likely to do it again and that so on and so forth it continues that that is a learning process like you, you would train an animal to or uh, you know uh, a, a guide dog for example or you know our children how we train uh, children early with behaviorism and, and rewards the same goes for for, for drug use here so we talk about in neuroscience reinforcement and there's positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement. Most people think, why take drugs? Well, actually, we take drugs because they're fun, they're, they're, they're likable. It's not a polit politically popular statement to, to make, um, but there is a, an element of truth in that. The effects, those positive effects, as we'll see, will diminish. But I've got pictures here of food, water, shelter, and sex. These are all regarded as primary primary reinforcers. These are reinforcers that are important for our survival. And this is what that motivational system that drugs of abuse get in. And to coin a, a well-used phrase, they hijack the system and take over. And they exploit systems that have been put in place and evolved through evolution to aid our survival because we you know we need food and water to survive uh, as an individual we need shelter from the hot and cold some of us need more shelter as it would turn out um, for us to survive as individuals we need to have sex in order for the species to survive this is you know all about you know, reasons why a system have has developed over a long long period of time and yeah there's a picture of rats there copulating but but rats have told us that they will also be substance misusers and we can see it in in our animals that they will take these drugs willingly in many cases um and show many signs that are similar to the human condition one of the things that doesn't get talked about much, and I'm not really going to address it today either, is negative reinforcement. That is, you escape from unpleasant stimuli. That is, you know, maybe life is really unpleasant. You might have another underlying condition, such as depression or anxiety. And in, in a way, you might self-medicate with drugs. For example, a common 
common ailment is having a drink at the end of a tough day um and that becomes a regular thing and maybe you take a bit more uh, but that escape that release from the tension or maybe you have a, you know like i say existing conditions such as depression and anxiety they, they, these become problems for individuals but you know we're not going to going to follow that now i want to tell you that dopamine is the culprit of all of this and the, these two panels of um, dopamine levels uh, being elevated in response to food uh, in, on the left hand side and to sex, in which case here we've got a, a male rat that has been exposed to a, a sexually receptive female rat. These animals have a little cannula in, in a very important part of the brain called the nucleus accumbens that is really a, a dopamine center and this neurochemical is thought to underlie motivation for food sex i could put slides up for food uh, for water as well um, and these are quite robust findings that have been been found so these are tapping into a system of dopamine and they are being elevated in response to motivating stimuli that are being pre presented, important primary reinforcers. Now, I want to suggest to you now that the the effects in that region of the brain that you know evolution may have selected and shaped for the purpose of survival also are exploited by amphetamine, cocaine, nicotine, and morphine here. They all increase in a massive way uh, the levels of dopamine in this part of the brain. This is the, you know, the, the phrase comes of, of hijacking this system. They get in there and they really work very well in there. Now, don't go away thinking that it's just these four drugs. Lots and lots of other drugs have this effect. Alcohol does. Um, uh, MDMA does. Lots of other drugs. Um, the only ones that don't really have such a big effect are things like LSD uh, and um, magic mushrooms. So really what we've got here is a, 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 an account, the, the information is an account that drugs are elevating a part of the brain called the nucleus accumbens, in particular the shell of the nucleus accumbens, the outer uh, area of it, and this releases vast amounts of dopamine now if you look at the slides you can see that this this part of the brain the nucleus accumbens here also connected to the ventral tegmental area are deep down in the brain they're they're buried right down not that far from from the brain stem which comes up from the uh, the spinal cord this means that they're very old uh, and they're primitive and they've been there for a very very long time and they are common areas that all mammals have as well. So the other, again, back to that idea of motivation and primary reinforcers, they're steering mammals uh, in, to engaging in behaviors that are gonna aid survival and continuation of the species. But of course, drugs come along and they put a bit of a, uh, um, a dampener on that and exploit this system uh, beyond all recognition. So how do we know all of this? How, do, uh, how can I convince you about this? Well, we know people people take drugs. It is a, I, I've, I've got to the age now that I'm so far away from somebody in their 20s to explain. This is Keith Richards, who is the uh, guitarist of the Rolling Stones. Uh, I'm always surprised, I don't know, but you know, He's often regarded to be the, uh, the, the you know, the, the living pharmacy, the walking pharmacy. Um, but we know a lot because of rats and rats will bar press. They will engage in work to take drugs. And this is all given us evidence for the, for um, people taking drugs and animals taking drugs that actually those centers of the brain are all highlighting this. So that's just a little bit of background, and I want to just build up a picture so I can talk about what, what we've done uh, at London Met in the past. Um, that 
now having understood that you know i've come from a perspective of dopamine and a perspective of learning dopamine facilitating learning in all its complexities I, i'm going to take you in into the idea that it's not all about the drug the drug is important for sure it's important mm -hmm. but the drug is not taken in a vacuum it's not taken in isolation it's taken in environments and in particular if they're drugs that are illegal and therefore have to be taken uh, on the sly in clandestine environments they those environments become repeated with that drug so we start to learn that actually where you take the drug becomes important as well so it's not just about the drug it involves changes in our learning it will change it will involve changes in how we think how we process the world at large and it will adapt it will hug the contours of motivation so it's actually changing the brain when we're doing this and ultimately that changes our motivational status so we engage in a behavior that perhaps you know if you read the the letter pages of some of the tabloids where they say you know just stop it's uh, it's an abomination actually you're engaging in a behavior that you find very difficult to stop because those motivational systems that are there for our survival are being used uh, you know, beyond, uh, above and beyond the call of duty here. So I'm going to just tell you the, a little bit about the theory that I kind of focused on and then and, and take it away from the learning theory and into cognition. So back in 1993, uh, Terry Robinson and Kent Berridge published this paper. It's got, you know, the, the title of it doesn't really uh, uh, betray how important it's becoming the addiction literature or the neuroscience literature for addiction, in which they talk about drug craving and then they have this phrase incentive sensitization. And that's that's the little bit that really is, is, is what I followed for, for many years and, and mutated on the basis of that. Now, it's 1993, that's a long time ago, just to, to, to let you know that they, they've still, they're still dining out on this. It's still a theory that is current. It's joined by other theories. And before we continue, I, you know, people will often say, wh wh which theory of addiction is correct? And I'll say, actually, they're all, all of them have elements that are right, and all of them have elements that are probably wrong. And in actual fact, they're not even theories of addiction. They're theories of subcomponents of addiction. They're not really, or they're only explaining a subcomponent. Each theory complains that, you know, ex tries to explain a subcomponent rather than the condition as a global element. So by its very nature, we're going to be missing out some features uh, as, as we uh, progress. But we, we acknowledge that. What they talked about was drug craving that actually the drug itself in, in many ways can be not problematic but the, the problem that people have is not liking of a drug it's the wanting of the drug the motivation that triumph of motivation over the reason and that steers all behavior they also talk about a persistence and reinstatement of drug craving that is even when you give up your brain has been reconfigured the hardware has changed and now it wants to take drugs and that even once you're detoxed and one could argue that detox is comparatively easy compared to uh, remaining abstinent um, is, is is something that's going to send people back so if your brain has changed you're more vulnerable uh, and you continue to be more vulnerable to uh, you know, uh, reinstatement, relapse. The bad news, and we'll have a look in a moment, is that as craving increases, the wanting, the desire, the motivation to take drugs increases. You want it more and more and more as a drug user or need it. The actual pleasure you get from it diminishes. It shows tolerance. And 
it, it's, it feels like it's a cruel twist of fate that you need to take more and more of the drug to get the effects that you initially had and of course that's subject to changes in biology but also in your environment that dictate tolerance but as you're taking more and more of the drug that is increasing you wanting to take more of the drug it, it exacerbates the craving side of it all so really you're not getting the kick out of it anymore but you're really needing to take it uh, and you're wanting to take it even in the absence of the thrill perhaps that was early uh, achieved at the initial onset of taking the drug so what i became interested in was drug stimuli i not the drug itself i mean the drug's interesting don't get me wrong and what it does all these different drugs do are, are, are fascinating but it was more to do with how the world the environment that the drug user was inhabiting was actually um steering the behavior it was making it very difficult for them to give up and you know we've got some drug paraphernalia here uh, in all its glory and there's lots more besides and i think one of the biggest areas of drug paraphernalia is every pub in the country uh, and every bar it's full it's a quasi-religious uh, uh place where you have a, a, a theater of of stimuli that predict alcohol arriving but drug stimuli take on a special meaning they they become conditioned or learned you learn a lot about them and they become increasingly more able to maintain drug taking even in the absence of actually the drug being present they're going to be pushing you to take the drug more and more so they're reminders you've learned that actually in their presence drug comes my way so actually i'll you know where is it i want to i want to take it i want that drug it's a reminder think a little bit like advertising why have they made advertising so very difficult for cigarette companies uh, you don't see it at formula one anymore you you don't see it in in supermarkets and uh, corner shops it's all all covered up these were all potent stimuli the the wrapper and the packaging uh, that you know makes people want to have that drug a bit more a bit like you know the smell of coffee or the smell of bread freshly baked bread makes you want to go and buy it it's the same sort of process so the brain areas that are, are being manipulated become more and more active as uh, as they are dopamine areas they get more and more active because of the drug this increases that learning and then what we have is this horrible really horrible um figure from robinson and berridge that i've adapted that basically says that we these two systems the wanting system and the liking system are are different and that we have these two systems that are working side by side but they're involving learning we are associating when we take the drug which you know, we don't need to worry about what the UCS is, but it's unconditioned stimulus, the drug, it produces pleasant effects initially. And we like that. So that feels good and we feel mellow and all the words that people would use to describe how they feel having taken a drug. But when they take that drug, if they take it for the first time in an environment, there will be certain things there that are significant to taking that drug. So if you're an intravenous drug user, there's obviously going to be a syringe and a needle. There's the tourniquet, there's the cooking up kit, uh, for example. Um, these become increasingly associated with that event, the feeling good, the, the pleasant effects that came along. You like those effects. So you do it again. You know, it's, it's reinforcing, it's rewarding. This leads to you, you know, when you then have uh, drug related stimuli like the syringes, the, the pint glasses, etc. This makes us want to take the drug. You know, you go into a bar, you actually I really want to have a have a drink or what used to happen before they banned smoking was people would struggle to give up smoking in the pub environments because they went hand in hand. They were predictive of each other. So if you were trying to give up cigarettes and you went into a bar that 
all the the bar related the pub related stimuli would induce craving you would be attracted to taking it and eventually used to come to it and, and consume it so what this is all telling us is that the drug doesn't get taken in isolation in a vacuum it happens with various stimuli uh, they become important and we learn that they go together like uh, Pavlov's dogs did in the past they learned that their captor when they brought food um, they would uh, salivate and the arrival of the uh, captor you know the, the experimenters was predicting of food and therefore they would get ready for that food coming and be salivating prior to the meal arriving in the same way here we have what we have is obviously uh, the out here's the example of alcohol yeah a lot of people you know it feels good they like it they get the subjective pleasure they feel inhibited they might feel more relaxed uh, de-stressed they have these effective actions but they, they don't take it in isolation maybe they take it in a pub and here's here's our you know a busy old pub you know it's got all the optics it's got the, the pumps the glasses the smells the sights the sounds of everything going on these are drug use. These are all powerful things that are are working to keep make you want to have a drink. You know, you think, oh, actually, you see that? Oh, I want a drink. You crave it. You you you, know, you really want it. You could kill a pint. Uh, you have the attraction for it. You go there, and yeah, consumption happens. Maybe a bit too much consumption, but that's another story. So from this. You know, we we have lots of stimuli. You know, drug associated stimuli become more and more able to control that behavior because that brain region becomes active. And there's lots of stimuli. What could they be? Well, you know, that's what we we started looking at, and we've we've gone beyond you know the the simple learning theory to to identify this, and we've seen that drugs uh, have an altered effect are uh, depending on a, a number of psychological phenomena and tolerance is one of them and um, you know most people are familiar with uh, what tolerance is that it's you know the diminished effect of a drug but what we're really talking about now is the increased effect of the drug the increased drive to consume it in the face of uh, of the evidence to suggest that this is not a good idea uh, for you to do this uh, yeah uh, our learning theories have told us this so we can and it has been established for a long time that things like tolerance to the drug are subject to the environment that if you take a drug in one particular environment continually you will develop tolerance to it if you take the same dose in another environment that can uh express itself as an overdose even though it's exactly the same dosage the body responds as if it is a higher amount than you are used to taking and the only difference is you've shifted your environment you've gone from a different room to say by the seaside you know big change that means that the body has not got ready for this and it's not preparing itself uh, whereas all the cues in your consistent environment where you've been taking it before, they're all telling you the drug's on its way and you prepare to take that. So we're going to move beyond those learning theories and just to, you know, talk about um, moving into cognition. This was a, a, a quote from uh, uh, William Miller some years ago talking about the behaviorist uh, Frank Logan. Who basically uh, provided a, a, a fantastic account of how one acquires addiction using learning theory but what was the problem was it described the dilemma but not how you get out of it and actually what what Miller was saying is we've got to move away from our learning theories and look at the higher order processing the cognitive side of addiction uh, which is where I'm, I'm going to head to uh, now. So what is going on to help us process this? So we're going to move away from our old uh, learning theories of the you know uh, turn of the uh, uh, 20th century, moving towards the kind of box and arrows 
that has typified cognitive psychology in, in the past. So we, you know, psychology changes its fashion, it changes its focus every so often. Something becomes the new new way of looking at things. And that's, um, yeah, yeah, I'm guilty of doing that as well. So what I'm going to talk about is, is basically things like executive functioning, controlling your, uh, and as humans, we engage in lots of behaviors that enable us to interact with the world in a way that is um, is appropriate. Although one can feel after the uh, the Euro final that appropriate behavior was uh, uh, certainly lost by a lot of people. Um, but in yeah, you know, most of our behaviors that actually were. Uh, are governed by more modern parts of the brain that control those primitive urges that dopamine and the nucleus accumbens uh, will will mediate. That we can, you know, we have been, you know, we've evolved and we are now blessed with a frontal cortex at the front of your brain, a bit easier to see on my head than perhaps many of you, um, because uh that now can override those functions and perhaps the more freudian of you out there uh would be able to draw parallels with uh, the id the ego and the superego here so what i'm trying to understand is unpacking the, the the mysterious black box in which we don't really know what those processes are you know learning theory is all about stimulus and response you if you uh if you if you poke something and you get a response like if you hit your knee with a, a tendon hammer it, it jerks what what's that process we want to understand that process and in doing so that's where we we we, we resort to the cognition the boxes and arrows of describing processes that are uh, mediated here so i'm going to focus on environmental cues but there are other cues as well. Priming does. Uh, drug users, drug drug pushers know well about this, but about giving free doses that are, are important to, to keeping people on the go uh, with their drug taking behavior. And also stress is a big one. Stress is a common enemy for every mental health condition. Um, and of course, uh, that is subject to a lot of consideration. But I'm gonna talk about environmental clues, the people, the places that are associated with things. And we're going to, one of the big problems that we find, uh, that we find is that it becomes automated. That Steve Tiffany's cognitive theory, moving from a learning theory to a cognitive theory, is well learned, well rehearsed, automatic processes that slip below the radar of consciousness so that you engage in a baby without you being actually that aware of all of the stimuli in the world that are pushing you in the direction to perform drug taking behavior. There are lots of things, not just the drug, lots of things going on. Um, so craving is non-automatic, we, we'll look at that, but what I'm gonna focus on here is uh, some of the attentional bias, the processing of information, that actually we are drawn towards our drug related stimuli, that they capture our attention, that they are processed preferentially above and beyond other stimuli in the environment. So we're gonna look at the uh, what, what we have looked at. I, I, was, I went into lecture mode then, um, as if I was, I was uh, talking to my level six and sevens, but uh, explicit processes and implicit processes ones that we're not aware about are really hard to deal with. Of course, they're hard to deal with. If you don't know that it's happening, how can you possibly uh, put the brakes on and stop that behavior? Um, so that becomes an important thing to understand what those processes are. Uh, we want to make them explicit so that people are aware of them so that they can actually realize that overcoming their substance misuse issues is not just about getting them away from the drug, but actually managing the, the world at large and how to deal with that. Um, I realize I'm starting to, to eat up time. So these are just you know the idea of drug habits that learning happens and it involves dopamine and then it moves. It's a dynamic process that means that people move from one 
position of learning into well learnt and well executed behaviors that are automatic so the world conspires to, to maintain the addiction and we're going to look at these these bits of these processes now um now there is a kind of a bit of a history really with neuropsychology where we try and measure functions and how thing, how brains are, are operating uh, to steer and manage behaviors and quite often they are not really um, ecological they're not real world they're very artificial and, and I'm going to be guilty of doing that as well so we take people out of their world put them into laboratories and study them in laboratories um, and see what the outcomes are and I've really you know I wouldn't like to make any great claims that I've done anything massively novel I've I've been uh, eroding at the uh, the question rather than inventing and stealing really like a like a magpie from the nests of other birds I've been stealing from other areas of psychology in order to um, shape an understanding of what's going on with addiction for example work that I've done on ADHD shares some commonality with with what what I uh, I've done and what I proposed to do so what I'm going to tell you is about what we've done is, is the processing of, of emotionally valent salient information information that's become important to the drug user over the time and I'm going to try and get you know this is something if you don't know uh, the Stroop program um, I'm going to show you some uh, words and I want you to just uh, yeah don't say it you can say it out loud you can do what you like but uh, just to, to have a look, look at these so some asterisks are going to come along first and you've just got to say the color that they are so okay so that that's pretty straightforward you, you know red yellow etc you know if you've got normal color sight that's fine what's the big deal okay try these again say the color is printed in again a bit of a doddle that it should be fairly straightforward the next one though So normally that that's that should have been a bit more difficult for you that should have been a bit more tongue-tied you might have had to think about it because there is interference in the color that the words printed in and the color that it is actually uh, the name of it the, the noun that is being printed there and that's a well-established effect uh, in psychology we took that we 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 we, we took the that basic process and instead of you know having just the color naming without inferences which you can see here um, then with interference you can see that actually there's conflict between the name of the word and the color that it's printed in um, we, we we adapted this and created an emotional stroop or an addiction stroop or in this case well the data I'm going to show you is an alcohol stroop and these studies were done uh, whilst looking at the genetics of uh, uh, of um, or a, a particular gene called the dopamine DRD4 seven repeat allele gene uh, but I'm going to just tell you about the neuropsychology here uh, but genes were linked with all of this as well then it, it, here we have words that were yeah I, I kind of made some of these up but we checked them out with people before but these were ones so smoking vodka Rizla, all, all of these words are kind of meaningful in terms of uh, drug related words and with my very first PhD student, Joe, Joe Lusher, back in uh, 2004, we published in Drug and Alcohol Dependence um, uh, the results of a uh, alcohol stroop, looking at alcoholics and co uh, a control group, non-alcohol control group. And what we found uh, that's highlighted in here is typical of, of the, the uh, stroop that they were actually much slower. Alcoholics were much slower at processing 
alcohol related words it was interfering with their process a little bit like uh the color of the word and the name of that that, that color as it was written uh were interfering when you uh, attempted to do that so this really means that um when a, you know, an alcoholic in this case and it's been repeated with several things we've done it with nicotine as well uh, and other drugs um that actually it's slowing down their processes it's capturing their attention there's a conflict here because of the meaning of it and these emotional stroops have been done on lots of conditions addiction here uh, is what we're seeing uh, with alcoholics and that it's, it's been shown to you know uh, in, be associated with increased probability of relapse so if you show this interference you're more likely to relapse and you're more likely to drop out of um treatment this is what other people have found since uh, and before so it, it, it's indicative of you know brain resources being put over to processing drug related stimuli and actually people need to know about this because it's making them increasingly vulnerable with regard to um, uh, relapse one of the other studies that we did we and uh, uh, is where you take advantage of uh, having a left and a right ear and that the information that's projected to both ears can be done independently and it's processed differently this is called a dichotic listening task and uh, we tend most of us to have language residing mainly in the left hemisphere and what we did was we 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 tried to see how people would process uh, and this was smokers that we used that were heavy smokers uh, and medium smokers um, if we project words independently to the left and right ear and how the brain is going to process that now the data indicate and I, I kind of like this this study because this is a case of when you get a non-significant result that's really good most most areas tend to have a positive publication bias where they only want significant data this is one where we got non-significant data and my it's quite difficult to get people to accept this um but what we normally have is um a bias towards the uh right ear or left hemisphere so what we've got here is units that are how many are they getting correct how many stimuli are they identifying if we look at neutral stimuli which were uh, i can't remember exactly what they were but they were everyday household objects um there was no difference really between any of the groups uh, in terms of the statistics but they had a right ear bias um, which is indicative of the left hemisphere what was interesting for us is that when we presented the same people with smoking related stimuli that bias disappeared and it disappeared in the smokers not in the other groups but in the smokers now there are lots of issues we can talk about with cognition and smoking but in this case the, the difference didn't manifest itself but what they were doing is they were using both the left and right ear and we assume here uh, left and right hemisphere was being both hemispheres were being dedicated and using that um you know, more resources more brain resources more brain power if you like uh, to process drug related stimuli it was capturing the attention more so that was that was you know, th this was giving us much more evidence as yes that actually you know lots of things are are working in tandem to keep drug taking behavior uh, something that continues now this is a a, a, a busy old slide I'm, I'm not going to go through it all but basically what this was was degraded images what I tried to do with a lot of the studies was try and make them as appealing as possible to engage in and so there's a little bit of puzzle or gamification uh, that has been involved in some of these and this was to to look at objects of different resolution now you all know now that this is some cigarettes um but we presented with lots of different degrees of degradation 
uh, pictures of these cigarettes and lots of other smoking related and neutral uh, household object related uh, objects. Uh, and I think there's there about 12 to 16 levels of degradation. And we started at, at the lowest resolution and then got more and more detail and asked the park people to say, you know, when do you, when are you confident you know what it is? When, what is it? And we would just measure the point at which they got it right. And uh, this has been done a couple of times by us at London Met in different ways with different, slightly different groups. But the net effect has all been the same. That those, this small, this number here, 7.4, is a small number compared to the others. And it was what this is saying is that they were able to recognize the smoking stimuli at a much more degraded level than um, other stimuli. And it was also true for those that uh, were, 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 were not smoking. So they're attuned. They were able to identify. They're processing these stimuli uh, far more preferentially. And we did memory tasks as well, looking at arrays, trying to get them to do these sort of guessing, you know, what was in the picture? What are you going to recall? And these sort of found similar sorts of effects. Um, so that, yeah, these were about being specific about um, drug taking behavior. I just want to have a little, uh, I'm going to have a couple of detours before I, I get to the end. And you'll see now that we've we've motored through some of the slides that I got. I do tend to use quite a lot of slides, but they're more for my benefit than perhaps for yours. Um, but actually, the, the processing of the world at large, not just drug related, is also compromised by by drug taking behavior. And this is looking at a theory of mine where we have to take the perspective of somebody else and understand that they have different ways of thinking to our own. And we looked at uh, emotions and visuospatial perspective. Oh, can you, you know, the six and nine, can you, can you understand that this is a different pers perspective to the one that you have? And what I did with, with a, a, another of my uh, PhD students, uh, Sharon Cox, in fact, she was my last one, was to look at um, fearful faces and um, neutral faces. And it's been kind of well established in the literature that people will process uh, faces differently uh, and that there's a you know, shifting attention towards certain faces is uh, is noted in different groups of people with different conditions but it's really using a dot probe where we replace a face with a a, a dot and you've got to orient towards that it, it it makes a difference whether the face was a smiley face or a sad face or a fearful face or a neutral face and without going into the 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 the, the, the huge detail that sharon and i and uh, Andrew and Kevin uh, engaged in was this is the reaction time uh, of by the difference between left and, and, and right scores to neutral, fearful and baseline stimuli for alcoholics uh, and non-alcoholics. And what we, we we see here is, and I thought I think this is a really interesting that they're, they're processing alcohol people are processing more co neutral faces as if they are fearful faces they're over inclusive in their processing we don't really know the reason why that is but uh, and it would be really interesting to to follow up with things like emojis uh, and figurative ways of expressing this uh, but it, it it's quite possible that it's down to the experiences that they have with people and uh, seeing perhaps more fearful faces in their worlds than they do neutral and, and happy. So therefore, they are, are, are being over inclusive in that direction. So there is a, you know, there are battles to be to be had there in which uh, problems are, uh, continue in, in the general domain of cognition that we've looked at. But I want to say, you know, this is my, my sort of theme is uh, drugs and drugs affecting behavior is often one of the ways we, we, we think. But it's a two way street. It isn't one way. 
we need to think that actually behavior will fit out, affect the outcome of drugs as well. So to kind of round up uh, is that, you know, where do I go next? And it's what I want to look at in, in future and have started to do is looking at the role of impulsive behavior and its interaction with those attention attentional mechanisms that steer people towards their drug related behavior. And the other one is to look at hormonal regulation and the neuropsychology of what we've been uh, talking about so far. Now, impulsivity is all about things like the Just No campaign um, that was once uh, uh, quite all the rage. Uh, it was it was a failed campaign. Um, but the simple idea is, you know, just say no, just, just don't take them. If that was if that was the solution, we wouldn't have a problem. Uh, we still have a problem. It isn't. It wasn't the solution. But it still seems to populate the um, the world of uh, tabloid newspapers. Um, so it's really about control. I mentioned earlier that executive functions were about control and how our modern brain is, is should be able to put the brakes on and, and, and steer our behavior appropriately. And impulsivity is is one of those things that we control our impulses. We stop ourselves doing things. And impulsivity is all about having a predisposition. Uh, it's rapid changes, it's unplanned, it's, you know, devil may care attitude uh, without risk to you know, your, your own survival. And there is no secondary gain for it. So people just in, involved in it, you know, they, they might appear to act without thinking is really what we do. And to measure that, the, the world of neuropsychology has looked at response inhibition, which is to stop well-learned behaviors and of course drug addiction is that well-learned behavior and what we want to sort of understand a bit more is how how come there's a failure of our modern brain to be able to stop that and what are the elements that are uh, contributing to that happening so uh, one of my interests uh, is also within the world of dopamine and this is where i i, I kind of got into this uh, is from the world of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. I have a kind of personal interest in this. Um, and they use laboratory methods for saying, oh, people with ADHD, they're very impulsive, they can't stop themselves. But one of the things that were, they, one little study buried in the literature said that if you make it more fun, if you gamify the, 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 the dull computer tests, that neuropsychologists trot out, then you don't see the effect. And that kind of got me thinking, and we, we did little studies on, on gamifying some of these uh, methods, and they're quite easy to gamify, actually. Um, if you've ever played Call of Duty, it's, it's not that far off a gamified version of uh, one of the tasks that are used in neuropsychology. And that task is called the go-no-go no go task, which, uh, for example, here, you uh, you press a button every time you see a number, uh, and the numbers are you know zero to, to, to nine, except for when you see the number seven, and you've got to stop, withhold the response. That's actually quite difficult to do. It's not impossible for, for drug users and people with ADHD. But when you gamify something like that, you might find the effects are minimal. So it does have the question is, how important is that then in a clinical picture if you mod modify it to make it useful? And that's where I want to want to go to next, looking at how tasks such as a go no go or a very similar version of that, the stop signal reaction time task, how these dry, turgid neuropsychological tests uh, can be gamified and interact with attention so stimuli grabbing your attention and interceding with it with impulse control mechanisms that make it very difficult for people to give up and this has all been put into theories really uh, you know the controlling aspect uh from nora volko who is head of nida which is the big uh north american drug um I wanted to say cartel, that's not certainly not the right word, a huge drug uh, organization that's got massive funding in the United States. 
And in the non-addictive brain, we have lots of control. And that that moderates all these systems at the bottom that are colder systems that are not as, um, you know, more subject to the learning side of uh, addiction. Whereas in our addictive brain, the control mechanisms are diminished and they allow for our more primitive, our, 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 our lizard brain, so to speak, um, to drive forward behaviours that are against our, our best interests in many cases. Uh, we might know that, but we just can't put the brakes on. And that's why I want to understand a little bit more in substance misuse, how that happens. And of course, it's quite important because this has implications for prevention, uh, certainly not for stopping it, it's a bit starting, um, but you know, once the, the, the horse is bolted, what can we do? So we try and look at you know, strengthening other reinforcers. You know, occupational therapy, the devil makes work for idle hands, find something else to do. You know, don't be, you know, don't fill your time with drug related activities. Gain control learn to manage that craving and something we haven't talked about but you know and i'm a, a firm believer in is, is about managing stress and this leads me partly to the final or couple of slides which is you know i want to look at attentional mechanisms and how they influence behavioral how our control mechanisms are compromised by that in a gamified world and one of the things that we we look we have considered is could we design an app that was kind of playful uh, uh, and, and engaging that would say actually you know you're you're well tuned into a drug world and you're going to have to fight this so to give people a little bit of information that they have to manage the world that they are in in order to 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 maintain a drug free existence or or some control over that. So that would have some, some clinical implications. And the final one, which you know, it, it impacts on this, is ovulatory hormones. These have a significant effect on cessation. And what I would like to, to, to look at there is looking at the ovulatory cycle and seeing how this impacts on neuropsychological measures so that different points in the cycle are people more vulnerable to uh, relapse and um, processing of stimuli that will push them in that direction. And this also uh, adds to the, um, the notion of stress, because particularly with things like premenstrual syndrome uh, and the likes, uh, very stressful uh, events causing lots of problems um, and I think this is a, is a worthy area for us to, to explore. And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to doing that in the next few years. And you'll be relieved to know this brings me to the end of what I, I, I was talking about. I just want to say thank you for listening to me ramble on about my life uh, and my explorations of, uh, of uh, drug associated stimuli. And my, my journey from a, a neuroscientist to a neuropsychologist and behaviorist and, and back again, really, to, to wanting to look at the biology of this all. So if you've got any questions, I'll, I will do my best to answer them. OK, yeah, thank you very much, Chris. It was a great presentation. Um, I do have a lot of questions, but I'm going to leave first um, to the floor. Yeah, I'll open to the floor, open the floor, sorry, for questions. Uh, you can either use the, the chat box or mm -hmm. use your mic uh, in case you need. Also, for, for someone who just mentioned um, about the slides, we, we will have the recording uh, of the session. Um, in, in, if, if you check this on London Med Research in YouTube, there's a channel, um, and you will find um, the Centre for Primary Health and Social Care there you will find the recording, give us a, a couple of uh, days for it to be uploaded. Okay, so, um, okay. Oh, Amanda, so Andrew, through. I love you both. <laughs> Amanda, okay, um, really thank you. 
Okay. <laughs> so I'm trying to. Okay, fantastic presentation. I don't know if you are checking on the um, chat uh, as well, um, Chris. Yeah, I think nobody wants to talk. I think I've probably exhausted them. No, I oh, see. we have Telly. Telly, would you like to? Go ahead, yeah, please. Thank you, Alina. Yes, uh, a very interesting presentation, Chris. Thank you very much. I just thank wonder, you. have you considered the social anthropological dimension of uh, drug taking in, in any way, in terms of um, wider cultural uh, perspective and, at times, the ritualistic nature of it? Well, uh, in my own research, no. Because I'm obviously quite reductionistic and and actually you know don't have the noise of anthropology. But one of the things I have been doing with uh, uh, one of my colleagues, James Morgan, and um, uh, somebody from University of Manchester, is a series of webinars that actually have touched on that, and particularly looking at new psychedelic medicines that are uh, coming out of South South America. That are very interesting and, and actually how different cultures uh, have been using these drugs that were perhaps now um, you know considered illegal for self-medication and actually it's all coming back round now because actually some of these things are very very useful but I, I haven't really looked at that I mean I, I, I did look at CAT which is the amphetamine um, like drug that was used uh, when we looked at it in a Somali population um, in London uh, to look at a particular type of uh, personality construct. But other than that, no, I have, you know, and I have to say, you know, we've got to bear in mind that different cultures have different perspectives and different policies as well. And actually the policies often make the, the, the effects of the drugs um, uh, problematic you know what, what what don't we like about drugs in the uk is isn't you know the health thing so much it, it's the crime uh and actually we're making crime by 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 having the drugs illegal but, but i'm going to get all give away my personal views on that <laughs> <laughs> so i'm sorry about i can't i can't say i, I don't have a uh, an anthropological uh, uh, um, arsenal of uh, information to, to provide you on that. Uh, I, I would imagine some of my colleagues might do, but uh, from my neuroscience perspective, no. Ah, Dom, welcome. Hi, hello. I thought I thought someone someone needs to be using the microphone here, so I, th I thought I'd give it a go. And I, I should say here that I'm, I'm going to be teaching Chris's prediction module next term so obviously i'm you know really interested in everything that chris is talking about here um but i was i was really interested in that bit you were talking about chris about um you know sort of this sort of drive for kind of grand theories of addiction and i i mean i'm i'm just curious about that i mean is that is that here to stay this sort of search for a grand overarching theory of addiction or are there better or worse motivations for seeking out those grand theories or i don't know just any of your ideas there? I, I think part of our problem with, with those sorts of theories, Dom, is is that they 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 using the word addiction for a start is is just a, a a shorthand, isn't it, for a lot of behaviours that are are underlying it. And actually, I think we talk about addiction and and the roads to addiction are going to come from multiple angles. And I don't think there will be uh, one overarching. Um, theory that will fit all because i don't think we understand it enough and certainly our diagnostic criteria doesn't really delve into it it skims over it my my view is that when i when i talk about theories of addiction i think they the theories of addict i think they're calling them a theory of addiction is a misnomer they are theories that address a very small subset of behaviors that are implicated in addiction some having greater or lesser bearing than others um when i've um, been at conference I, yeah the last one i went to which was a good few years ago now 
it was interesting that they that you know there was one slide that they'd adapted and said well this theory addresses that this one is doing this and another theory is, is dealing with 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 a, another level of explanation and i don't think that there is going to be one theory that will be able to uh, account for it uh, I, I really don't i guess it keeps it interesting that's for sure um but uh, it keeps it challenging but i think our, our ideas of what substance misuse and addiction are, are perhaps uh, a little bit uh, i wouldn't say they're simplistic but i think they're probably narrow and we need to understand the different processes uh, underlying a condition like we would with schizophrenia or depression they're not one thing they're not one thing That's thank you chris uh, and dom for the question uh, i i like to invite chris if you can go through the chat um yeah i'm just looking i I'm trust that reader. you can do it Yolanda. Yolanda, okay. I'm a slow reader, so give me a moment. <laughs> I had trouble as a kid, so I still have. So Sunny saying oh, I'm sick of you and so we're not. Oh yeah, well, yep. Yeah, talk to me, myself, and Dominic. Uh, we, we've got the uh, MSc in addiction and mental health that we run, so that that that's cool. Um, I can tell you more about that. You can always email me. I'm going to be off for a couple of weeks, so but yeah, if you email me in two weeks, I'll provide some information. Um, Maureen, very thank you. Uh, isn't amphetamine type medication? It, it is. Um, actually, amphetamine, uh, you know, is used in a small amount of cases of ADHD. But what is used mainly is what was commonly known as Ritalin, which is uh, methylphenidate, which actually, when you look at how it works in dopamine, is like cocaine. And that's why it gets a bit of a bad reputation. And it does seem to be quite counterintuitive. Uh, for ADHD, why that would work. Um, but it's thought that in ADHD, they have too little dopamine in a very specific part of the brain. And that by taking uh, amphetamine, it increases it and allows for behavior to, to normalize. And it, it, it works within about 20 minutes. It's what's quite interesting about ADHD is they are at high risk of uh, engaging in substance misuse and abuse and subsequently addiction. Uh, but if they actually take the medication earlier, um, they are protected from it to some extent. Not completely, but to some extent. Now, of course, you know, I, I would perhaps want to argue there's a biological mechanism and a behavioral mechanism, but it could be m just about allowing people to engage in education and school still, rather than be excluded and then find uh, uh, other things to do with their time. Uh, but you're right, and it, 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 it's 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 a bit of a head scratcher when it comes to ADHD. Why something like amphetamine would work, uh, but it's uh, it's to elevate a part of the brain that uh, is it, it, kind of modulating behaviour that is underactive. Um, I hope that answers your question, Maureen. Andrew, what do you think of the notion of an addictive? Uh, the addictive personality is kind of being dispelled. Uh, I know it's one that people use quite a lot uh, to, to describe as a shorthand, and I kind of see that it's useful for that. But there are certain types of personality, and this is something that we looked at back you know, in the mid 2000s, uh, called sensation seeking. That is, people that want to um, want to uh, explore the world more and engage in risk-taking behaviour they're more likely to, to, to engage in those sorts of um, uh, behaviours. So rather than a, a, on, you know, an addictive personality, I would say there are certain personality constructs that lead to a vulnerability rather than to an individual type of personality in itself, uh, which hopefully that also answers your question, Sunny, as well. Uh, Shani, sorry. Um, Alana, do you think that forbidding the thing you are addicted to i making it illegal going on a diet oh don't talk to me about diets i'm not happy about that at the moment make it illegal going with a increases craving more stuff. i think it probably makes for for your average adolescent uh, it might make it's the forbidden fruit isn't it and it makes it somewhat more uh, attractive um 
I, I think you're know, making things illegal. I think the problem with making things illegal in this respect, uh, it, it certainly hasn't worked making it illegal. The war on drugs is a failed war um, and, and a war that's created quite a lot of casualties on the way. Um, is that you, you put it into the hands of people that are going to give you uh, unclean things, uh, difficult things, uh, expose you to new drugs, for example. So I'd say that was a, a, a danger. And of course, when you're going on a diet, as I can tell you myself right now, that I've had to go on a diet because lockdown has not been kind to me. Um, yeah, I, um, I want to eat crisps a lot at the moment. But I am using my front lobe uh, to the best of my ability to uh, to try and fight those desires uh, to overcome them. Uh, but yeah, I think you know when you when you're on a, a diet or you're uh, you know you, you're you're in withdrawal, and uh, that withdrawal is a very powerful motivator. Can a one year or one year old three year old become addicted to phones well uh, the idea about being addicted to the phones i'm not sure it's the phones that one becomes addicted to i think that i think phones are the electronic equivalent of the hypodermic syringe and needle they allow information in fast uh, it's what's happening on the phone what's happening on the computer i think that has a, a, a powerful um mediator of behaviors whether a one-year-old or a three-year-old i'm not so sure um i don't think it's great for, for them to be on phones i think it would probably be best avoided um i guess they're playing games not checking checking their facebook or instagram status um uh asha hi i know yeah dopamine is is released uh, when we see people in scanners that are craving their drug their, their craving has been induced the areas that contain dopamine are are firing away or certain areas are uh, yeah. oh amanda I I, you got your hand amanda up. has your hand I hope up this is not about your awam <laughs> And you, and, you, and you'd be really disappointed if I was on a if you were on a collaborate session with me and I didn't ask you a question. <laughs> so uh, um, I was just really interested if you've got any views on what what the difference is between someone, for example, let's use alcohol because it's kind of a more common or something that we can at least admit that everybody takes part in or can take part in but if you if you're a sort of regular drinker um you know a regular frequent drinker and probably on occasion drinking too much at, at what can you do you sort of think there are some kind of clear differences from the research between that person and how that tips into into sort of kind of an alcohol at what you would define as alcoholism or is it is it really just all on a spectrum and it's just kind of there's obviously a tipping point um a diagnostic tipping point really when when do you when it becomes probably it's functionally Im impacting isn't it i mean one of the problems is you know it's the stereotypes that the media give us of alcoholics in particular is people sort of roaming around sort of <laughs> yeah. you, know, drunk, you know all of those sorts of things that we, we you know we see on tv and and the likes that is that's for sure that's one group of people but actually there's a lot more people that are uh drinking at hazardous levels uh mm. but aren't going out on a friday night looking for fights uh and populating a and e with injuries um they're, they're they're sitting in front of the tv quietly drinking a bottle of wine a night if not more um so th there's a whole group of people that are, are kind of have alcohol problems but aren't being detected in the same way that say somebody who's uh you know fitting the stereotype that we may have built up about an alcoholic who's out of control for example mm. don't know if that answers your question amanda I know I tell yeah. you not to try and answer your question. Yeah, I suppose, well, I suppose it's that sort of tipping, and it's that, as you sort of said, it's kind of a tipping point. But I wondered if there was any 
like there's been any sort of research on kind of finding sort of genes or dopamine differences um, in dopamine releases in response to alcohol or sort of something yeah. like that Th there is a high likelihood that there is a yeah you know, looking for a single gene is 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 almost futile uh, there are multiple genes of modest effect that are implicated with alcohol for example there are also genes that are implicated uh, in protecting people from alcoholism right um, for example people uh, from southeast asia uh, there's the, some some of that population don't possess a gene that enables them to um, metabolize alcohol therefore right. you get this very horrible like the worst hangover you've ever had type of effect uh after consuming a bit, just a small amount of alcohol because they can't process it, it's toxic and then their body's not clearing it and this gives them this reaction that is really unpleasant and therefore you tend not to get that as a problem for, yeah. for, for that group you know you're not going to i think i've inherited that gene through during the menopause <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Not sure what to say to that, but <laughs> yeah. But no, it does make a big difference if it's always a horrible experience. Then of course you won't. Yeah. Again, yeah. that's that's the learning, isn't it? We learn that there's a bad outcome to it. Um, mm. Again, you know, how many times have you had a hangover in your youth and said, "I'm never going to drink again," and then actually, a couple of days later, that that yeah. that's overridden. But yeah, oh, when no, it's an unpleasant that. effect <laughs> that is continued, you tend to uh, um, not do that. But, you know, yeah. and that, okay, that has been one of the basis of, of of therapy for alcoholics is to give them a a, a drug called disulfiram, which uh, makes it difficult for them to process alcohol, and therefore they feel wretched, and therefore therefore the assumption is they won't take the alcohol. They just don't and has it been effective? Ish. Well, really, I'm going to say that not much has been effective, has it, really? Because we still have the problem. And it's a recurring problem with a lot of relapse. So probably not really, no. Mm. Yeah, I have a Brilliant. Okay, thanks, Chris. <laughs> yeah, Chris, if I may yeah. now, I, I have a question, Mr. Lander. Um, I, through through your um, brilliant talk, I have to say, a, a very a very interesting oh, to know all the things um, that take place, in, including the brain and how the behavior can be affected. You mentioned clearly that if we could measure, I mean, sorry, you mentioned that the brain, you show some scans uh, of the brain, the changes, that happen in the brain yeah. of someone who has um, addictions. And my, my question is, I, I can see that the, many of the conditions you mentioned, including alcohol, we can observe some medicalization there because we have, well, at least we have medicines to deal um, to some of these, pro with, with some of those processes. But I don't see much of biomedicine. By that, I mean, uh, we have is there any chance or, or or possibility of having biomarkers for example to express to show <laughs> to identify those changes and if in clinical practice and i wonder how much that approach would change the perspective that you see and you have criticized in public health and we do the same but from the social sciences um in terms of of, of the type of messages and and the simplicity of the message you know you can you can drink you can count for example how many things you drink and as if it is enough i mean it's about yeah. the numbers I'm forgetting about all the environmental conditions that of which you also uh, take us through uh, when when explaining how uh, an addictive behavior works but why we don't have much more of that data or information that probably will be beneficial about the brain changes about mm -hmm. about the detail of the brain changes yeah yeah i think we we have information from animals um uh, 
we, we've seen changes in in the dopamine regions of the brain there, but not not just that. And we've seen changes in glutamate and dopamine in particular. But one of the things I'd say about the brain imaging studies is we all get seduced by the pictures. Uh, they're very attractive and we tend to believe them as well, more than we believe a graph. Uh, but the resolution of those scanners is, is not sufficient yet to actually dig down into brains and, and get to the real nitty gritty areas that we would want to. Um, I think also one of the problems with, with humans is you can't do those before and after studies. Uh, you'd have to do long prospective yeah. studies, which are very expensive and hard to get funding for, in which you'd want to measure the changes and, and, and measure the unfortunate people that uh, descend into substance misuse. Um, okay. So I think the, the, you know, the, the ethics might get in the way of, of understanding that. And that's why we go to the animals, isn't it, really? It, it, we go to animals when, when human ethics gets in the way uh, of wanting to you know, address a particular question. Yes, yeah, you can see that the same happening with breast cancer. I mean, it's all down in rats and mice. Yeah. Is, <laughs> it's the same ethical yeah. um, thing. But um, OK, so I think there was there were some more comments. I'm checking on the chat again. Thank you for, for your answer, Chris. OK. So someone talking about, Shani talked about a, a gene uh, and being South Asian. I, I don't know, that was probably the conversation before you were yeah, responding to Amanda, be I believe. The, uh, yeah, the, um, I can't, uh, can't remember what allele it is. It's the uh, alcohol dehydrogenase gene. It stopped the, certain, certain people uh, from Southeast Asia that they, they have a horrible reaction to alcohol. And therefore, it protects them. And it's it is it's one of the few things that you can actually say is down to a particular gene. Um, but really, when we when we're looking at the genetics of any of these conditions, it, it it's um, it's not clear cut. It, it, you know, there's there's a lot to explore there. And again, you know, what what Dominic was saying earlier about overarching theories. Is we need to know we need to know what we're looking for uh, within a particular condition. So we need to know about the condition so we can actually chase the genes, if indeed there are genes. Okay. But having unspecified ones is, is you know or, or, or muddied uh, descriptions is is harder. So. Okay. Well. Shani, email me. Um, it's chris.chandler at londonmet.ac.uk. Um, like I said, I'm going to be away for a couple of weeks, but uh, I'll, shall I stick that in my? Uh, I'll stick that in the the chat. Yeah, we're some people asking for the masters as well, so that would be helpful. There you go. Thank That's you, my Chris. email. Oh, thank you, Claire. <laughs> Very kind of you. Okay. I think that I think I, I've exhausted That's everybody, Jolanda. So. Uh... <laughs> Not at all. Um, no. I exhausted thank myself. You so <laughs> I think that you must be exhausted as well. You've been talking <laughs> to stay in a bit. Okay. So thank you, Chris. I suppose. Okay. We, we, we bring this to a close. Thank you so much. Pleasure uh, to have you, you here in this seminar. Thank you. And um, we hope to, to have you at, at another point, um, <laughs> probably in next year at this time, <laughs> um, yeah. just to I hear a bit so more about this use. <laughs> yeah, the inroads in your, in your new research and, the, and how those new directions well, they have, taken, really good have taken you. We've got a group of people now within the university, um, yeah. like like Duncan and Dominic and James Morgan and Sam Bambury, who are all interested in addiction. And, and there's a few more as well that I don't don't know. Um, so I think actually it, we've got an exciting point in time at London Met where we've got a group of people that yeah. are interested in the same thing. And I think that's going to be really, 
really uh, beneficial mm. for for all of us and and for yes. and for knowledge itself yeah very interdisciplinary for what you're saying as yeah well. i think that's where we've got to go i mean yeah yes sure. perfect perfect thank you so much i'm going to stop the recording now and thank you okay. so much chris um